I'm Walter Cronkite. This is the story of Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, the strong man who in a little more than a decade led Turkey out of the Middle Ages and into the 20th century. The story, The Incredible Turk, as the Prudential Insurance Company of America presents the 20th century. In the Middle East today, chaotic, vulnerable to Soviet expansion, Turkey, modern, powerful, and a rarity in this area, pro-Western, is prepared to defend herself against any aggressor. This is the border between Russia and Turkey, guarded day and night. The Red Sentry does not know he is being photographed from across this border. He feels that he is being watched. He is also suspiciously watchful. Today, Turkish cavalry defends the broken, desolate terrain at the edge of Asia Minor. These cavalry squadrons are part of the strongest fighting force in the Middle East, the Army of Turkey, a democratic-minded member of NATO, military partner of the United States. Modern Turkey, strong and stable, was created out of a dying oriental despotism by one man, unique in history, Mustafa Kemal, called Ataturk, father of the Turks. In a moment, this story, The Incredible Turk. By 1900, the Ottoman Empire, land of many races and religions, has lost her ancient tolerances and her world position, is reduced from medieval splendor to medieval squalor. Ruled by inept autocrats, ruined by foreign wars and exploited by foreigners, the people are sunk in poverty, lost in lethargy, mostly illiterate. The Turkish Empire continues to exist only because the European nations cannot agree among themselves to dismember her. Before World War I, Germany has plans to embrace Turkey as an ally, then to subjugate her as a satellite. To visit the sick man of Europe, as Turkey is called, comes the German emperor himself, Kaiser Wilhelm II. He is received with more than ceremony. His glowing promises, such as the Berlin to Baghdad Railroad, are believed by the Sultan and his government, and even by the nationalist-minded young Turks. When war comes, Turkey will waver between her old friend Britain, allied with her hereditary enemy Russia, and her new friend Germany. On October 29, 1914, Turkey takes into war, on the Kaiser's side, her obsolescent army. February 1915, the British plan to force the Dardanelles past Gallipoli, take Constantinople, and free Russian shipping in one naval campaign. Mustafa Kemal is an unknown officer commanding a feeble Turkish division at Gallipoli. His brilliant strategy and ferocious personal leadership changed the course of the battle, the campaign, and the war. After 10 months, the British signal defeat and steam away, leaving on the historic shore of the Hellespont a new hero in Turkey. One victory, one great military commander are not enough. The defeat of the central powers by the Allies brings the end of the old Ottoman Empire. It is carved away, leaving only Turkey proper, a much smaller and more homogeneous land which, with leadership, may become a nation. 
November 1918, the ships of the victors crowd the harbor at Constantinople after World War I. From the palace of a weak and corrupt sultan, there comes no opposition. Turks bowing to Mecca accept their fate. From France and from Great Britain, occupation troops disembark to take over the ancient capital. Sure that the Allied armies in Constantinople will do nothing to prevent it, Greece is preparing for an invasion of Turkey. On May 15, 1919, the Greeks land their troops. In Ankara, in the heart of Turkey, Mustafa Kemal organizes the Turkish liberation movement, takes command of the free Turkish army. From far off Constantinople, the Sultan repudiates him, but Mustafa grimly swears that he will gain Turkey's freedom or die. No other general equals this man, and the Turkish soldiers need only to be led to fight. They are traditionally warriors. Quickly, Mustafa Kemal gathers the forces of unoccupied Turkey under his almost unchallenged domination. His hastily recruited bodyguards stand ready to defend him with their lives. Mustafa Kemal pits his cold, inexhaustible toughness, his unyielding determination, his knowledge that the people are with him, against the continued fanatic opposition of the Sultan's government. Ammunition must be made by hand by old men and hungry workmen, boys and children. Mustafa Kemal's Turkey is going into battle with the Greeks. The war with the Greeks lasts three years, from 1919 to 1922. The Turkish people know it is a war of extermination, atrocious, no quarter given or asked. Heroically led, the Turks advance against the invaders. The women leave their endangered homes to carry shells to the army. September 1922, the Greeks are driven back to the Aegean Sea. Offshore, Allied rescue ships stand by. Into the seaport of Smyrna, called Izmir by the Turks, poor thousands of Greeks, joined by sympathetic Christian minorities, fleeing before the armies of the man whom the British call the most terrible of all the terrible Turks. From the ships, bread comes to the docks for the desperate refugees. Bread so that they may live another day. September 9th, 1922, the Turks enter Smyrna, last stronghold of the invaders. They take vengeance against the Greeks for whole Turkish villages wiped out for their kinsmen massacred. The burning of Smyrna, the final atrocity that both the Greeks and the Turks disavow, ends a war that has become an unendurable nightmare for both sides. Its polyglot population takes to the sea as the flames destroy the great Homeric city. Star and Crescent fly over liberated Turkey. Mustafa Kemal Pasha, married to a woman of Smyrna who personifies his ideal of Western freedom for all Turkish women, 
is Chief of State and Supreme Commander of the Army. With the winning of the war, he removes his uniform, never to wear it again. He is now granted dictatorial powers by the elected National Assembly. In Constantinople, to be officially renamed Istanbul, the foreign occupation troops are evacuated. In the fall of 1922, Sultan Mohammed VI, whose family has reigned for seven centuries, fears for his life and goes into exile as crowds cheer his going. Mustafa Kemal's victorious army enters Istanbul. First president of the first Turkish Republic, Mustafa Kemal, during the 1920s, keeps his limitless wartime powers and his command of the army, makes the hard, dry town of Ankara his capital. His fantastic dream is not of empire or conquest, but of creating a democratic Turkey, a new kind of Turk in his lifetime. The Ottoman sultans also had been caliphs, secular and religious rulers. Turkey's new government separates church and state. Instead of Friday, day sacred to Islam, when Muslims everywhere ritually cleanse themselves, the Western Sunday is proclaimed the official day of rest. Although Mustafa Kemal insists on personal religious freedom, it is known that he personally detests the gesture of abasement prescribed for worship when Muslims touch their foreheads to the floor in their brimless headgear. To Kemal, this headgear, the Fez, symbolizes Turkey's oriental fatalism and ignorance. He will abolish it. the fez becomes an act of treason. European hat makers unload in Turkey, but woe betide the foreigner who dares laugh at a Turk in his new hat. More than 90% of Turkey's 13 millions are illiterate. Mustafa, who earned in school his second name, Kemal, meaning excellent, himself takes charge of replacing the difficult, obsolete Arabic script. A new Latin alphabet, a revised and standardized Turkish language, are prepared by experts bullied into haste by Kemal. To make a modern nation capable of government by the people, all Turkey must be sent to school. Islamic traditions are shattered. A man's image, Mustafa Kemal's, is displayed in public. He also orders all Turks to adopt Western-style family names and is himself christened Ataturk, meaning father of the Turks. The faces of Turkish girls and women are hidden and they live in virtual slavery until Ataturk unveils them by decree. Now divorced from his wife, he takes pleasure in the company of emancipated women and insists that all Turkish women adopt Western clothes, gives them equal rights under the law after abolishing polygamy, and opens to women all the trades and all the professions. Ataturk, who has eaten the black bread of poverty and lived in the front lines of war, acquires the trappings of power. His proud, fiercely disciplined bearing, which annoyed his superior officers years before, does not change now that he acknowledges no superiors. The men around him treat him as emperors and primitive chieftains and modern dictators are treated. Flatter and yes him, seek the smallest of privileges, such as lighting his cigarette. Mm. 
man in a hurry, he has no time for opposition or for modifying his programs, is too concentrated to pay the slightest attention to the awkward and harassed civil servant who is about to drip peach juice on his shoulder or to the waiter who will wipe it off. Although gossip is rife of his spare time affairs with women, of private drunken orgies by which Ataturk relieves long periods of relentless labor, this monarch in mufti never loses his public dignity even at play. He is adored, also respected, also hated and feared and ruthless in dealing with those who oppose him. Now he goes into the countryside, to remote villages, to archaic farms, to rouse the lethargic and primitive peasants. His credo, Turk, be proud, work, be confident. There are two ways of conquering, says Ataturk, by the sword or by the plow. To show his phlegmatic peasants what he wants, he buys land, demonstrates the advantages of tractors. Ataturk, son of a civil servant, military careerist, now all-powerful dictator, becomes a model Sunday farmer. The world is anxious to restore good diplomatic relations with Turkey. From the United States comes Ambassador Joseph Clark Grew. For this revolution and high accomplishment, one man is primarily responsible. The name of Ghazi Mustafa Kemal will forever be associated with the development founding of the Turkish, the new modern Turkish state, and will forever be inscribed indelibly upon the rolls of history. The Turkish nation is democratic by nature. I have no doubt that the American nation, which has gone so far in this ideal, is Turkey's friend in her aims. This will not be all. Perhaps it can lead to a world of love, with all old prejudices erased, with all nations coexisting in peace and prosperity. When the Great World Depression of the 1930s slows down economic reconstruction in the country, Turkish people by the thousands wait for Ataturk to bring him their troubles and their problems. To the man in the street, Ataturk is his personal boss and his personal friend willing to listen, wanting to help. All over the country, Ataturk preaches the ways of the West, scolds and harries workmen to carry out his forcible plan for industrializing the Turkish Republic. Turkey begins to move into the 20th century, builds dams, mills, factories. The tempo is fantastic. Industrial production under Ataturk increases tenfold. Still, there are growing pains, a poorly designed and poorly run heavy industry operating at a loss, profitable light industry deliberately run at an excessive profit to cover the deficit. Turkey's textile mills being a notable example. The European nations compete briskly for Turkish trade, for her surpluses, her chrome, and her tobacco, in exchange for the manufactured goods, machinery, and arms she imports. Turkey's foreign relations are excellent, but war is in the offing. Ataturk hopes Turkey can remain neutral, as indeed she will do during most of World War II. But meantime, he must mend his defenses and re-equip his neglected army a bayonet army from an earlier era of belligerence. Turkey's dictator has said, 
Hitler will lead a dynamic nation to destruction by whipping its passions. And Mussolini will play Caesar. Time is proving him right. Aging now, Ataturk gives his personal fortune to the nation, lives quietly, spends time teaching the youngest of his six adopted daughters the alphabet he made all Turkey learn. Watching his young nation, Father Ataturk believes in her democratic future and has preserved for her under his autocratic rule the Republican Constitution and the secret ballot which will elect his successors. His severest Western critic grudgingly admits, Ataturk is dictator so that Turkey may never again have a dictator. The Shah of Iran is among the neighboring rulers who come to admire Ataturk's prospering progressive nation. The Emir of Transjordan comes. The Arab world is impressed by Turkey, but later when nationalism develops throughout Islam, none of its leaders will have Ataturk's genius or his convictions. An ailing Ataturk spends much time aboard the yacht presented to him for his help by the Turkish people. Long ago, he has said, I will lead my people by the hand along the road until their feet are sure and they know the way. Then my work will be done. On November 10, 1938, Ataturk dies at the age of 58. Thirteen years of his life he spent in active warfare fighting for Turkey. For 15 years until his death, he was her first president and absolute ruler. His last command is that his successor be one who will follow his course. ismet i is that man. Today, this mausoleum is a shrine for his people, who well and truly mourned for Ataturk. Marching past in fighting trim, the soldiers of Turkey are the sons of the ragged forces who followed him to fight for Turkish independence 40 years ago. Modern Turkey is a vigorous ally of the West. She welcomes not only foreign products, but the foreign bases and men on her soil to help defend her way of life and her NATO alliance. Not all of her problems have been solved, however. Her economy is heavily bolstered by, some say virtually dependent on, Western aid. Her democracy is still far from perfect, and historians still argue about Ataturk, the man who in less than two decades made Turkey over. His methods, his tyrannies, his personal habits. Yet none denies the staggering achievements of the Incredible Turk. These, our allies, guarding the gates to the east, are the inheritors, the children of Mustafa Kemal Ataturk.